food him. Man. Well, it is good to see y'all again this week. Um, I know that just in our nation, our country, we've been dealing with a lot of, you know, sicknesses and COVID and, you know, it seems with COVID, we don't even, you know, things like regular colds don't even exist these days, but they do. They do. Uh, and so, so it's good to uh, see faces, but we also are grateful and prayerful for those that can only view uh, online. And so we just want to remind you that we love you, we're praying for you, and it's just good to come together uh, for a brief moment today to worship our Lord. Uh, we're going to continue uh, in our study of the Gospel of Luke chapter 10 as I will close out Luke chapter 10 this week, and Pastor Preston will take us into Luke chapter 11 next week. Uh, our focus text here is Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, and we will read and we will pray. Verse 38, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her, home, her house. And she said she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which would not be taken from her. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are our possession, that you are our reward, that you are our great and heavenly help. We pray for Father, Lord, as we sit before you at your feet, as we have heard and lifted song of praises, of worship of you. We pray, Father, Lord, that you would help us as we sit before you, that we would cling to you, that we would hold fast to every word, that you would help us to grow, and that you would give us a greater appetite for you, that you would give us a longing for you that is above and prioritize above all things. Help us to learn from this part of the scriptures, which you have given to us to learn, and that we may grow and mature in you. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, uh, we spent some time uh, in Luke where Jesus has an encounter with a lawyer. We talked about this last week, uh, where this lawyer was supposed to be an expert of the law. And he and Jesus had an exchange with one another about uh, the two greatest commandments of all, to love thy neighbor as thy, to love God with all and to love thy neighbor as thyself. And as Jesus uses a parable of the Samaritan to teach this lawyer what it means to love others as you love yourself. And now after this encounter, Jesus, they leave Jerusalem and they go a couple miles in and they end up in a village in Bethany where they are blessed by a woman named Martha and Mary with hospitality. Now, as we read, as the story goes, Martha makes herself busy with preparing a meal for them, while Mary bypasses the pots and pans to sit at Jesus' feet. Now, this friction, this creates a little bit of friction between the sisters. Jesus, being filled with all wisdom and discernment, uses this conflict, as he often did, as a teaching moment to emphasize the priority of fellowship with him over service. We shall learn why the opportunity to sit and listen to the words of life from the author of our salvation is better than being consumed with distracting tasks for him. And so we're going to discuss a few observations from this text. So before we start to get into uh, these scriptures, I think it's helpful to, to have maybe some contextual understanding of the dynamic between these two sisters that we might want to briefly explore. Now, Bible scholars, though they're not for certain, uh, they believe that Martha might have been the oldest of the sisters. And some of the supported evidence that they give is, number one, that Scripture identifies the location as Martha's home. 
So Jesus and them, they come into Bethany, into this village, and the Bible says that Martha welcomed him into her house, okay? And Mary, probably being the youngest sister, lived there along with their brother, Lazarus, okay? The second thing is that, you know, Martha, when you look at uh, just the few stories about her, she seemed to demonstrate the disposition of the oldest child that is used to responsibility, that is used to having to care for others. And you see this kind of manifest in her character as she offers hospitality. She's the one that offers hospitality by welcoming Jesus and his disciples into her home. And she takes the lead in preparing a meal after they had traveled a couple miles from Jerusalem. So as the oldest, she feels obligated. She feels a sense of obligation to ensure that their needs are met, that they have rest and food. Another uh, example would be, you know, as Martha demonstrated care for younger siblings, uh, is in John chapter 11. Now, you remember in John chapter 11, that's the story where Lazarus becomes very sick to the point of death. And the two sisters send messengers to Jesus to ask him to come quickly so that he could lay his hands on them so their brother can be healed. Now, without getting into the full story, we do recall that when Jesus finally shows up to Bethany, Lazarus is already dead, right? And how many days was he in the tomb by the time Jesus showed up? Four days. Four days he had been there in the tomb, okay? And so when you look at Martha's reaction to this, the Bible says as Jesus is coming into the village, it's not Mary, but it's Martha. Now remember, both sisters are extremely grieved at the loss of their brother. But it's Martha who gathers a strength and took initiative to go out to meet Jesus, to plead with him on behalf of both of the sisters while Mary, her other sister, remained in the house. So you see some of these oldest sibling dynamics kind of playing here. It's not in all cases, but you see this in a lot of cases. Uh, another thing about the oldest sometimes is that the oldest tend to be the bossiest of the group with the younger siblings. Okay, and it's possible uh, that this was the reality here. Okay, you know, so the oldest could be a little bossy, and then if you like my household, the youngest resists the authority of the oldest. That's usually how that works. Okay, and so, and so when you think about that, it's possible that this could have been the case, and so that's important because this might support the reason that why when Jesus came in the house, you notice Martha doesn't go to Mary to get her like in check. She go to Jesus because, see, now she's got an advocate in the house. Now she goes directly to Jesus and files her complaint. Now, when you hear what she has to say to Jesus, what you take away from it, that she not only took issue with Mary, but Martha seems to express some frustration with Jesus because she perceived him as probably being a little passive in the situation. You know, that's her challenge. She says, Lord, do you not care? that my sister has left me to serve alone. See, Martha, in her assessment, this is what the problem is. The problem is, is that she's doing all the work while Mary sits around and does nothing, and does nothing. As far as she's concerned, that's the problem. But, but we know that's not the problem, okay? So, so what is the real problem? The real problem is that Martha was so fixated on what Mary was or was not doing she not only lost her, lost her uh, joy for serving, but most importantly, she lost her focus on Jesus. She lost her focus on Jesus. And see, this can happen to us a lot, even in the church, when we spend most of our time examining others' walk with God, and we lose sight of what God's will is working in our very own lives. See, we miss out on the restorative and life-giving nourishment God has prepared for our own hearts. Are oh, we so busy looking at what someone is or is not doing? And so focusing on others in this way will produce frustration in us. That frustration will cultivate anger. It's what will happen. And then when anger is there, the fruit of resentfulness will flourish. Okay? And what does the Bible say about resentment? Okay, two things I want us to take away. Number one, resentment produces Conflict. Conflict. See, strife will cause instability in our relationship because resentment eats away at us on the inside. 
because the anger we feel is causing inward pain that will eventually, like a smoldering volcano, erupt in fits of rage. And so this is why Solomon rightly observes in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, he says, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. And so Martha is grumbling inside her heart. She's saying within herself, why must I do all the work while Mary does nothing? Does not God see? Does not God see? And if he does, why doesn't he correct her? Or as we say sometimes in our own self, we go, well, doesn't that person have the spirit convicting them too? We'll say that. So remember, resentment produces conflict. But resentment produces something else. It produces bitterness. Bitterness. See, once contempt takes root unchallenged in our hearts, we will often justify attitudes by affirming our own sense of self-righteousness over someone whom we have conflict. That's what we do. And when those things begin to happen, envy is not far away. Envy is not far away. And this posture towards people is not of the spirit, but it is a part of our fallen condition, our sinful condition. This is the reason why James, in James chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, what does he teach us about this? He says that, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast or be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is what? Earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. You see, so, so what you start to picture here is that these things grow. They don't just start out of nowhere. I always tell my wife all the time when you see somebody just kind of really just having it out, I always tell us that there's a story there. Now, we don't know everything, but that person that just wake up one day and just go off of somebody, there's a long list of things that have happened that have caused this situation. And it grows. And we have to be careful about the growth process with that. And remember, when you start talking about envy, it was envy that gave us the very first murder in human history. And that's Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. Okay? So we have to remember. So resentment produces conflict, and resentment produces bitterness. So in comes Jesus. Before this thing gets way down the road to something else we don't even know about. So Jesus now comes in and he has to refocus Martha, okay? Kind of like sometimes you have to do with your children. They get the bickering and going on and stuff like that. And at some point, the parent better insert themselves, okay? So we can deal with attitudes and problems and get everybody refocused on what's going on. So Jesus opened in response. He says, he repeats her name twice, Martha, Martha. Now, I would say personally, Every time I read this passage of scripture, the smells of my own childhood start to come back. Because this reminds me when I was growing up, whenever my full name was called by my mother, I knew I was troubled. Whenever I heard her say, Jason Samuel Price, I knew something I was about to, here's something I didn't like. Okay. And so when you see Jesus talking to her, he says, Martha, Martha, you know, two things. It reveals his disapproval of her reaction or attitude. Because remember, Jesus disapproved of some things, okay? You know, we in our American church, we like to highlight the love of God, and God does love us, okay? But just like with my own church, I love them, but I don't approve of everything that they do. I'm not pleased with everything that they got going on. And surely if I'm fallen and sinful, can feel that way, how much greater is God who is more patient than us, more loving than us, but because he is God, he does not approve of everything. So Jesus opened in response, Martha, Martha revealed his disapproval for our reaction and attitude, but there's something greater going on here that we have to pay attention to. But it also demonstrates his gentleness in his care in dealing with Martha his gentleness and care. You see, the way he calls her name, he calls her by name with an affection of a father to a daughter whose distress troubles his very own heart. He sees where she's at, and it 
troubles him too. He didn't want to see her this way. He approaches her as a teacher, as a heart of a teacher who is concerned for their student who is struggling in their class. He see her trying hard, but she's struggling, and this concerns him. This is how he approaches her with love. And notice in his response, he does not condemn her. Okay, he doesn't give her a list, look at all these things, that's why you're here. That's not how Jesus approaches her. But rather what Jesus does is that he addresses the root problem, the root issue, and he does so in love. So what are the root issues? Well, it says in the text, the first thing is she is worried about many things. She is worried about many things. The text says that when Jesus entered Martha's home, she immediately immersed herself in preparing, which might have been an elaborate meal. We, we don't know. But she immersed herself in preparing for the Lord. These are good things. But she immersed herself in it. But the problem was, was that she was distracted with much serving. Distracted. Okay? And see, serving God and serving people is a good and a great and a wonderful thing, okay? And what she was doing was a welcome and an expression of love through hospitality. But however, however, to lose sight of the priority of just being with him was of great concern to the Lord. Being still in the presence of God is a soul nurturing in Jesus' words or life. He is our food. He is our portion. Or as he says in John chapter 6, he says that I am the bread of life. He sustains us. And so Jesus' primary work is to feed us the word that by it, by his spirit, it strengthens us to do his work. You see the connection there? Word first, then work. Word first, then then work. Just like in any classroom, when we was growing up in school, you got to sit and get instruction first before you can go out and do anything. Okay? And a lot of times we, we just so busy doing things that we don't realize that as we get down the road, we flame out because we haven't received all the word from God that builds us up and strengthens us. And so a heart that's focused on Christ would not be distracted with worry. What else is going on here that he's dealing with? Okay, another thing he's dealing with with Martha is that a loss of control produces anxiety. A loss of control produces anxiety. And you see, often there is a way that you and I want situations and circumstances to turn out. Okay, and in order to ensure we receive the desired outcome, what we're going to do? We will attempt to try to control the process and the people involved in it. That's what we'll do. But see, here's the problem. When things are not working out the way we plan or people do not cooperate with our will, anxiety and frustration will start to settle in our hearts. That's what will happen. And if we're not careful, if we could just stay with me on a little bit of imagery here, the weed of bitterness can take root. And once it takes root, it can grow. And everybody can appreciate this in Carpus Cove. If the weed of bitterness grows, it can produce the pollen of anger that spreads everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. And so to be clear, though, anxiety is a normal reaction. It is a normal reaction in our human condition for loss of control. But, but that's not the issue. It is how we respond to that anxiety, to that fear. It is how we look at it is what matters, okay? And so a troubled spirit will not only overtake us, but it can also drag others down with us in the pit of despair. And so what does this all mean for us? What is the application? One of the primary things we need to focus on is that we are to seek Jesus and lay all concerns at his feet daily, hourly, moment by moment as we need to. We leave all concerns at his feet. And when we get there, that's where we leave it. We leave it and trust God in his timing and will. Okay? My grandma used to always tell me all the time, you know, and this is when I wasn't a Christian, but it's amazing how I didn't think I paid attention to a lot of this stuff, but it all starts coming back uh, once I got saved. But she used to always, she said, well, baby, here's the problem. We pray to leave things at Jesus' feet, but then we go back there and we pick it back up and carry it off again. We carry it off again, okay? No, we need to leave it there 
and let God deal with it in his timing and in accordance with his will. Because, see, one of the central things that we need, because a lot of times we need to let go of control. One of the primary ways we do that is humility. Humility enables us to let go of control and give our worries over to God. Humility helps us to turn over the steering wheel. Not just get in the driving seat, but no, let's get way back in the back of the van, okay, and just let God do the driving. Let him take us where we need to go. Okay, so Paul gives us some healthy exhortation, which happens to be one of our children's focus songs uh, about prayer and anxiety in Philippians chapter four, verse six through seven. Okay, and what does Paul say? He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, not in some things, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, that includes our understanding, okay? Because remember, God's ways are higher than ours. God's understanding is higher than ours. He is not like man. He does not think like us. Just because you and I don't understand it does not mean that God is not moving. Sometimes we have to wait and be patient. And so when we give these things over to God, what does Paul says? He says that in the peace of God, which surpasses all understandings, will do what? Guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And some of that guarding is from ourselves. Some of that is from our own thinking that is raging against the word of God. Because what happens so many times is that when we go before God, our experience becomes the Bible instead of the gospel itself. Because I experience these things, then logically, God, this is what I should do. Now, God knows exactly what we experienced because he was there. He was right there with us the whole way. But that's not the issue. But we have to trust God and give those things to God so that by his spirit, it will guard us, our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then Peter adds, okay, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 through 7, what does Peter say? He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that what? At the proper time, he will exalt you. At the proper time. Why? Because he says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So when we go to God, we must not believe in ourselves that God does not care because I have not heard a response to my prayer. God always answers prayer. It's just that he's going to do it in his timing. There's a, um, it's funny, in the Lord of the Rings, in one of the first episodes, uh, Gandalf is coming into the village, okay? And Frodo's waiting for him. And I think Gandalf is late to the party, okay? So he rolls up and stuff like that. And he stops and he sees Frodo and they just kind of stare at each other. And Frodo says, you're late. And Gandalf says, a wizard is never late, nor is he ever early. And I always think about that with God, is that God is never late and he's never, he's always on time. So if it's not happening right now, trust that God is working. And when it happens, it may not happen the way that you look, but it's going to be perfect and it's going to work for our good. It's going to work for our good. So a couple of concluding statements as we close out. Amen. Closing out. So, uh, As we can see in the text, Mary had the correct response to Jesus' presence. She had the correct response. For he tells Martha, Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And see, Mary chose to prioritize eating from the table of fellowship and intimacy with God rather than toiling over earthly food portions. So overall, what is God teaching us in this exchange between he and Martha and Mary? What is he teaching us? A few closing thoughts. Remember what I said, serving is very important because God has created us to serve him. But we have to remember is that God, number one, God prioritizes fellowship over service. He is more concerned about being with you than you doing things for him. Because God's will is going to be carried out in your life one way or another. We don't know how this is going to happen, but God's will will be done. But he prioritizes fellowship over service. 
And see, Mary appeared to understand the extraordinary opportunity they had to be with the Lord and listening to him while he was near. And this is a much more profound situation because remember, during that time, they didn't have, the gospels were not written. There was no New Testament writing. There wasn't another preacher that can come into the Bible study and have the words of life and sit there and have a Bible study and teach them. No, Jesus is the words of life and he's right there in the house. So this was an extraordinary opportunity that had to be with the Lord and listen to him while he was near. And this took priority over all of the concerns. But see, sometimes like Martha, we are rushing to serve God to prove that we are dedicated to him. We're just rushing. And remember, the Lord's first concern with us is intimacy. Intimacy. What do I mean? Prayer. Not just read another word, study of the word. Fellowship with the saints. Participation at the Lord's table, etc., etc. All these means of grace gives us intimacy with God. Because it's more important to God, just like with the Israelites, before he sent them off in the promise, he bought them before Mount Sinai because they must know their God. You must know who you're going out to serve. Know him intimately. And so these things take priority. And so while serving is very important and is a necessary work of our life, it is secondary. Why? Because at Jesus' feet, we receive grace, help, strength, and instruction that builds us up in faith that enables us to serve in the way that honors God, that is not self-serving. Okay? So being with God and serving God are linked together. They are linked together. And our inward spiritual growth is a matter of great importance above outward serving. And this is why when you see in the Bible, you see his servants often spent long seasons, God spent long seasons with them before he ever launched them out in whatever ministry of works he had them to do. So we see some examples of that. So I think about first Moses. Now, how old was Moses when he died? He was 120 years old. But the Bible says that Moses spent 40 years in Egypt, raised in Egypt. Okay, and what did God do with him there? That he raised him in all the wisdom and all the knowledge and all the technology and all the handwriting. How how do you think he learned how to write on tablets in Egypt? All these things he raised him in. And when he was done there, he cast him out in the wilderness for 40 years more. And what did God do with him out there? That he first... He learned how to submit to authority by being under his father-in-law's Jethro's household. He got married, had children, learned how to care for a wife and some kids. And he took a job as a what? A sheep herder. Because that's where God found him. You know, he wasn't out looking for the burning bush. He was out doing his father-in-law's work, caring for sheep. So for 80 years... God worked providentially in his life, building up character, putting him through all sorts of different things. So by the time God showed up on the scene, he was as ready as he was going to be. 80 years to only do 40 years of God's work. 40 years. We see David, right? So in 1 Samuel 16, right, he gets anointed as king of Israel. Now, how long did it take before he actually was established as king of Israel? Almost 15 years. And what happened in that 15 years? Because I talk about David all the time. I've been writing about him in the Psalms all the time. Is that David went through a lot. You know, he was on the run from his enemies and, you know, dealing with all this and being cast out by his brothers. All these different things that David went through that God was building up in him so that, not that, so when God talks about him being king of Israel, God often said that he will shepherd my people, that he will have a shepherd's heart and leading my people. Almost 15 years. Almost 15 years. And then we have the 12 disciples, right? We get to the New Testament now, right? They walk with Jesus for three years. And they didn't simply like stay in their lives and then come to Jesus for a Wednesday night Bible study or just come for a certain class and then go back. No, they left wives, children, families, businesses, gather what they have, and they went to be with Jesus. Live with him. That's what Jesus asked him to do, to follow me, to be with him. 
And during those three years, we, we see the Gospels. They went through a lot. It wasn't all great, as Pastor Preston says all the time. But with him, they learned a lot about who their God was. They learned a lot about, about who, their, who they were themselves and how much further they needed to go. And during those three years, Jesus worked in their lives, trained them to prepare them for when he was to depart. And then Jesus dies. He rises from the grave. He ascends back to heaven and he sends down the spirit. And these men, this small group of smelly fishermen, despised tax collectors, set the world on fire. On fire. Because before all that, they was with their Jesus. And even when Peter and them were preaching the gospel and they religiously saw them, they can tell. He said, they was with Jesus. They can tell. But intimacy first. And then Jesus Christ himself. Right. The Bible says that he was 30 years old before he began ministry. But when you read the Luke account, which gives us probably the most details about his early life. OK, we can see how the father worked providentially in the life of his son and him being having to flee to Egypt and all these various things as he walked in fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures. All these things. He didn't start any ministry to do any of those things. And at the age of 30, he began to start his ministry. He lived 30 years to only do three years of ministry. Three years. So you start to kind of see a pattern here that remember that God is working in our life. He desires intimacy and time before serving. Now, also remember, number two we take away is that maturity in our fellowship and intimacy with God increases fruitfulness and serving. Remember, we talked about those are linked. So you and I are going to be spending time with God and then we're going to be serving. And those two things should be working together, working together. And often a lot of times I see it in Christians all the time, including myself, that sometimes we start to get frustrated and flame out and start walking in the flesh more. But we, if we start paying attention, we're not really spending time with God like we should, like we should. So maturity and fellowship increases fruitfulness and serving. The hearing and studying of the word of God trains and equips us in the works of God. And like Mary, we ought to take every opportunity to sit before God's feet like children, eagerly gathering for story time. Eagerly gathering for story time. Okay? It is in his presence we grow in the understanding of the character and the will of God. It is at the Lord's feet he builds us in an appetite and the desire for more of him. And like Mary, he becomes our good portion. Okay? And we remember what we choose to feed ourselves, that is what will grow in strength and will manifest itself in our works and actions. Okay? And so we are to hunger and thirst for God as a baby who cries out for his mother's milk. We are to hunger and thirst for God as a baby that cries out for its mother's milk. Because that's what Peter tells us in 1 Peter Chapter 2, verse 2, he says, Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Long desire. And so this is the good portion that Mary has chosen. Her helping of food was to feed off the words of Jesus, which contrasted the choice of Martha, who anxiously prepared a meal that distracted her from sitting at the words of life while he was near, while he was near. And as I've said earlier, remember, God is not like us. Uh, when it, God is not like us where there are times where we often will quickly spot people's gifts and we want to put them right to service in the church. Right to service in the church rather than prioritizing a person's spiritual health and showing value in them as a person over what they can do for the church. You know, I tell my wife all the time that it's a problem systemic around America. We're so busy trying to put people in the big machine. You know, we lock it in on what they can do, but we don't care about who they are. You don't even know them. You know, we was in, when we spent a couple of years away from y'all, glad we're back, uh, in Fort Worth, you know, we, they, they used a new members class as a harvest center for new laborers. And, from people, you, and you don't even know these, you don't, what? I mean, you don't even know me. You know, you want to, well, we heard you was a pastor. This, what if I teach for heresy? 
I mean, are you just going to go by what I say on a form? But see, this is what we do. Okay, this is what we do. And see, when we treat people in this way, such persons can walk away feeling used and undervalued. Because what they can do is more important than who they are. And we have to remember that this is not God's disposition towards his people. If you see nothing else in the story of Martha and Mary, this is what you see. This is not God's disposition. He's not, he's going to enjoy this plate of food that's coming. But he's more concerned, I just want to be with you. Just come sit down here with Mary. Just be with you. Food will wait because I have the real food that will sustain you. Okay? And remember what Jesus said, what his own food was. He told the disciples when, in John chapter 4, when he was at this, uh, with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, and they came back because they were supposed to be bringing him food, and they was wondering whether he got food already. He says, my food is to do the will of the Father. Okay? The will of the Father. And so we see this manifesting in the story of Martha and Mary. So there's nothing you should remember is that we all have gifts and talents and God has given them all to us and he will endeavor, we will use them to his glory. They are very important. But as far as God's concerned, not more important than you are to him. He's more concerned about your welfare, what is going on with you, what is happening in your life first before you get up and start doing a whole bunch of things. Okay, because if you do, if you get up before you're fully nourished, you're not going to survive. It's nothing like, you know, getting up and deciding you're going to go run a 5K, but you don't eat enough of the right food and enough food in the morning. You're not going to make it. The, the, the golf cart is going to have to come and pick you up when you start walking. Okay, you know, so, and that's not what you want. Okay, and that's what, not what God wants. Okay, and so remember that God wants you. And through this knowledge and understanding, he will produce in us the all-important works. We will serve him in a way that's not attempting to prove anything to God. We will not serve him in such a way out of obligation because God doesn't want that either. But we will serve him because we love him. You think about your children, you do for them, not because you're supposed to, but if you truly love because you love them and you desire to see the best comes from them. And in order for that to happen, you can't just give them things. You have to give them yourself, your very own self. And that's what Jesus is doing with Martha. He said, you should come down here and sit with Mary because I'm about to give you myself. Because you're that important. Remember, you know, God, Jesus died on the cross so he can have you. He purchased us so he can have you for himself. You know, just like John says in Revelations, he, he pitches it this way, that when we're in heaven, that Jesus' name will be written on each one of our foreheads, identifying each one of us that we belong to him. And that is how he treats us right now, today. He belongs to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that though we are fallen, though we had enmity, hatred in our hearts for your word, for your gospel, and for your truth, but that you died for us, rebels and sinners, and that you did so out of love, out of the grace that abounds in you, because you loved us, and that we are your possession. So help us, Heavenly Father, to hold fast to this truth. Help us to be filled with this love, the knowledge of this love, so that as we are with you, that we will serve you with thanksgiving and gratitude. That we will remember always, no matter how difficult things get, that you are for us, that you are with us, and that you work everything for our good. We pray this prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.